hi, welcome back. This is going to be my second video in my series on vector addition. And this video is going to be focusing on Coulomb's law. And surprisingly enough, Coulomb's law has a lot to do with vector addition. So we're going to go through this example together. Um, and I'll be asking you questions along the way. And yeah, let's just get right into it. And I will be following my little algorithm that I posted on D2L for you guys. So if you want to follow along, feel free to do that or just do your own method if that works better for you. But the first thing that we're gonna do is read the problem and that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So we have, the example that we have is two point charges, Q1 and Q2 are held in place, a distance R apart. Another point charge of charge negative big Q and mass M is initially located a distance B from both charges and released from rest. You observe that the initial acceleration of negative big Q is A meters per second upward parallel to the line connecting the two point charges. Find Q1 and Q2. Okay, so that sounds like a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo, but let's break this down. I'm, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my buzzwords. If you want to, you can pause right here and try and find them yourself, or you can just follow along with me. Two point charges, Q1 and Q2, are held in place a distance R apart. So that's cool. We know that there's two point charges and Q1 and Q2, and they're held a distance R apart. Another point charge of charge negative Q and mass M is initially located a distance B. So we're going to say initially located and a distance B. They're two separate things. From both, I'm going to say that this is a big long thing. So a distance B from both point charges and it's released from rest. You observe that the initial acceleration of negative Q is A meters per second squared upward parallel to the line connecting the two point charges. And we want to find Q1 and Q2. Okay. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm going to break down each of these buzzwords point by point, and we're gonna figure out what they mean. So the first one, we have Q1 and Q2 are held in place, a distance are apart. So that sounds like exactly what it sounds like. They're Q1 and Q2 are a distance are apart. So I'm going to label that one. Another point charge of charge negative Q, that means that we're given the charge. We're going to be given the negative big Q charge. Three of mass M, we're given the mass of negative Q. Initially located. Now this could mean a few different things, but usually when we hear initially located, it means that there are going to be some sort of change. So I'm going to say that there will be a change occurring. And then we have a distance B from both point charges. So that means that negative Q must be a distance B from negative or from Q1 and a distance B from Q2. Okay. And then we have a released from rest. That is our change. That is what's changing. So that is the change. Seven. We have the initial acceleration of negative Q is A meters per second squared. We're given the value of A given 
the value of the acceleration. Eight is upward parallel to the line connecting the two point charges. That gives us the direction of A. And finally, nine, find Q1 and Q2. It gives us what we're trying to find. Gives us what we're trying to find. So that is a complete breakdown of all of those buzzwords that I just found and what they mean. The next thing that we want to do is we want to draw a picture of what's going on. So let's go back to our buzzwords and try and draw this guy out. So we know that there's two point charges, Q1 and Q2, and they're held in, in place a distance R apart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my point charges that distance R apart. Label that Q1, and that is Q2. Okay, so now we have our Q1 and Q2, and then it says another point charge of charge negative Q and mass M is initially located a distance B from both point charges. So what that means essentially is we're gonna be creating an isosceles triangle where we have, so same, opposite, same, that's how I always remember isosceles triangle. So we're gonna have this negative Q charge right there. And it's gonna be a distance B from Q1. And it's gonna be a distance B from Q2. So now we have this isosceles triangle with negative big Q, Q1 and Q2. So this is our picture, right? Um, let's add a few more things to it. And then we'll say that it's done. I'm going to say, the next thing we should do is create a coordinate system. So I'm gonna say that this is positive Y direction and this is positive X direction. And another thing that I wanna label is this initial acceleration that this negative Q is experiencing. Since this isn't a free body diagram, I can do that. This is just a picture to help me understand what's going on inside the problem. So we observe that once it's released from rest, this negative Q experiences a acceleration that's upward and parallel to the line connecting the two point charges. So it's upward and it's exactly parallel to that Q1 and Q2. So I'm gonna say that this Q1 charge experiences this A value. And we know what that value is. It's It's given to us, it has this, initial acceleration of A meters per second squared. And it's perfectly upward. It's parallel to the Y axis that I defined in our coordinate system. And so what this question is asking us to find is to find Q1 and Q2. And we can assume that this means the magnitude and the sign of Q1 and Q2. Okay, so now that we have a picture of generally what's going on inside this problem, I want to go back to a buzzword that I highlighted at the beginning. And that is this upward parallel to the line connecting the two point charges. I want to talk about why this is important to the problem. So I want to go back to 141 and I want to say that the net force experienced on an object is equal to the product of the mass and the acceleration. So we can say, since mass is a scalar and doesn't have a direction, the direction that, that the acceleration is, we can also say that the net force is also going to be experienced in that direction. So if we have a acceleration that's perfectly upwards, our force net, our net force, is also going to be in that direction. So now that we know that our net force 
is also in this upward direction that's perfectly parallel to the line connecting the two point charges or as we defined it perfectly in that positive y direction let's think about the horizontal components of net force will there be any horizontal components in this net force no there will be no horizontal components in this net force that negative q is experiencing so whatever q1 and q2 are their horizontal components must cancel out so that's really important so let's put that to the side that the horizontal components must cancel out. Now let's talk about the signs of each of these Q1 and Q2. So I want to take a survey real quick. So gut reaction, do you think Q1 is positive or do you think it is negative? And the same for Q2. Do you think Q2 is positive or do you think it is negative? Okay, so let's decide on what signs Q1 and Q2 are. So let's ignore Q1 for, the, for a second. If we just look at Q2 and negative Q, the general direction that the negative Q wants to go is away from Q2. So if Q2, Q wants to be as far away from Q2 as possible, what sign should Q2 be? It should be the same sign as negative Q. So I'm gonna say that it has a negative charge. And same thing for Q1. If negative Q is moving generally in the same direction as Q1, what sign should Q1 be? It should be positive. So now we have our signs, and now we want to find their magnitudes. And this is going to be where our vector addition comes in. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a dotted line right down the center and make both of these right triangles. In my opinion, it's a lot easier to deal with right triangles than it is to deal with isosceles triangles. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So each of these becomes R over two instead of R, but the Bs remain the same. And now we have these this bisected angle, but we can say that both of these angles right here are the same. So we have one angle and we bisect it. That means that each of the two angles that are the product of the bisection are the same. So the next thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to draw this free body diagram for negative Q. So I'm going to erase this, but we know that Q2 is positive and we know that Q or we know that Q1 is positive and we know that Q2 is negative. So let's draw a free body diagram for Q. Okay, so I'm gonna draw the net force on here, which we know has a perfect parallel to the Y axis. We know that that's where our F net is going to be. But let's draw our forces from Q1 and Q2 so we can maybe decide how we want to define our F net. So since we know that gives off a repelling force, I'm going to say that the force is going to look something like this. So, so F Q2. It's going to be going away from Q2. Negative Q is going away from Q2 but it is going in the opposite direction but it's on the same line as B. So the same angle as B is with the X axis. 
And then same for Q1, but this time it has an attraction force because Q1, it has a positive charge. So I'm going to say that it has this attractive force in the same direction as Q1 along B with that same angle theta in the, with, with respect to the X axis. Okay, so this is where the vector addition comes into play. So just like I did in the previous video relating vector addition, I'm going to break down these two forces from Q1 and Q2 into their components. So if we want to keep it just like how we did before, I'm going to bring down my Y component, and I'm also going to create an X component for our force diagram. Let's start with the force from Q1. So the force from Q1, the triangle that we created looks nearly identical from the one that we drew in our picture above. So I'm going to say that this angle right here is defined as theta. Okay. Now let's look at FQ from Q2. So this looks a little bit different from our picture where we defined the theta with respect to the negative. It's leaving the x-axis, so it's not in the positive y, it's in the negative y. But we know that it's going to keep continuing going upwards. And so I want to try and define my theta in a similar way that we did for Q1. So what corner do you think theta will be defined as? Do you think it's going to be defined here in the upper left or here in the lower right? It's going to be here in the lower right. And that is because if we just flip, if we take our lower triangle and we flip it up into the first quadrant, it will create that same angle that we created in the um, for Q1, and therefore it will be the same if we just flip it along the Y axis. So it's going to be that lower right hand corner. One thing that we should remember from the very beginning of our solving this problem is that the horizontal components must cancel out. So let's define the X component of FQ1 and FQ2. So what trig function should we use to define FQ1 and FQ2? We're gonna use the cosine function. So FQ1 cosine theta equals FQ1 X. And similarly, F two cosine theta equals f q two x. So let's remember, we have to make sure that those are zero. So we want our sum of the forces in the x direction equal to zero. So the only two forces that we have in the x direction are q2x and fq1x. So we want to say at F Q one X plus F two X is equal to zero, but we have to be careful. So look at how we defined our coordinate system. What direction is the component of F Q two going? Is it in the positive X direction or the negative X direction? in the negative x direction. So we have to remember that when we're plugging in our values. So I'm going to say that f1 cosine theta minus f q2 cosine theta equals zero. And that's all we have to do. We just have to remember that they, it is equal to zero. So we don't have to worry about it any longer but we wanted to make sure and define that in this case. 
But before I erase this, there's one important thing that I want us to remember and to look at. So now that we're done with the, the horizontal components must cancel out, I'm gonna erase this. And let's think about the next important part of this. So now let's move on to the next important thing that's very important about this problem. So let's look at our equation that we just wrote about regarding the cosine theta function. So remember when we bisected that angle, the picture, I said that if we take one angle and we bisect it, that was, those thetas must be equal to each other. So if we know that both of the thetas are equal to each other and we take the cosine of that, that also means that they're equal to each other. So if we know that FQ1 cosine theta minus FQ2 cosine theta equals zero, and the thetas are the same, and we, when we take the cosine of each of those thetas, that's the same, it must be true about the forces that Q1 gives onto negative Q, that bigger point charge, and what Q2 asserts on negative Q, the, the bigger point charge. It must mean that FQ1 and FQ2 are the same. They have the same magnitude. And how is that possible? Well, if we look at our equation for the Coulomb force or the electric force, we see that it's KQ bigger Q over R squared. If we're looking at the force between Q1 and negative bigger Q, we would see that it's KQ1 big Q over B squared. So that's good. We want to know that. But if we want to look at Q2, we want to say, okay, that's KQ2 big Q over B, B squared. And of course, the both of the Qs, the big Qs are negative and Q2 is also negative. So if we know that the force of FQ1 and the force from FQ2 are equal to each other, what must be true about the magnitude of Q1 and Q2? Since nothing else changes in the problem, K remains the same, the magnitude and direction of negative Q, big Q remains the same, B remains the same. It must mean that Q1 and Q2 have the same magnitude. Of course, we decided that Q2 has a negative and Q1 has a positive sign. But the only way for this to work properly, the only way for this negative big Q charge to have an upward facing acceleration is if Q, the magnitude of Q1 is equal to the magnitude of Q2. Let's figure out what that magnitude is. So I'm gonna erase this. Okay, so now since we know that our net force is only in the positive y direction, this must mean that the sum of our y components in the in FQ2 and FQ1, they must create the F net. So let's find those. So I'm going to say, so that's the Y components that we're solving for. So F Q to Y is equal to F Q two. Now we're looking at our trig functions. So what trig function are we going to use to define the Y component? We're gonna use sign. So the Y component is defined for FQ2 as FQ2 sine theta. Now let's do the same thing with FQ1. So what trig function are we going to use to define the Y component of FQ1? We're going to use the sine function again. Okay. So now we want to define our F net. 
we know that the sum of the forces in the y direction is going to equal our f net our net force that negative q experiences that's perfectly upwards so let's add up our components in the y direction and have that equal to f net okay so let's let's plug our values in so f one sine theta plus f q two sine theta equals f net and let's write our f net in terms of variables that we know so at the very beginning of the problem we underlined and made sure that we knew what variables we knew so if we want to go back we know that it has a mass m and we know that negative q experiences an acceleration a meters per second squared so i'm going to say that f q1 sine theta plus f q2 sine theta is equal to the mass of negative q which is just m times the acceleration that initially experiences which is just a So now we want to define. So now we want to simplify the left hand side of this equation. So remember back, I said that the magnitude of Q1 is equal to the magnitude of Q2. That means that they have the same magnitude, but they have different signs. Since Q1 and Q2 have the same magnitude, I said we can further go and say that fq1 magnitude is the same as the magnitude of fq2 so and since the angles are the same the thetas are the same i'm going to say that we can write this as times f one sine theta and that's also equal to mass times acceleration okay but what is fq1 in terms of things that we know well we already know what it is we're going to use coulomb's law so fq1 is equal to k which is just a constant d magnitude of q1 which is what we're solving for times the magnitude of the other charge that is experiencing the force which is negative q over the distance squared well what's the distance between q1 and negative q that's b so it's b squared so now that we know that we can plug in this value into our equation down below so i'm going to take this formula for fq1 and plug it into my equation down here so i'm going to say that two times k q1 times negative q which this is the magnitude of by the way b squared times sine theta equals mass times acceleration now we want to solve for q1 which is what the question told us from the get-go that's what we're solving for we're solving for the sine and the magnitude of q1 and q2 but we know that q1 and q2's magnitude is the same so since this is the absolute value i'm going to refer to it as plain q so now this is just simple algebra, but I'll go through it so that you can see it. So I'm going to multiply this by B squared on both sides. And that gives me two K Q one Q sine theta equals M A B squared. And now I'm going to divide basically everything else except for Q one. So I'm going to divide by 
K big Q sine of theta on both sides. Q1 is equal to MA of B squared all over 2K Q over sine theta. And Q, since Q1 is equal to just the negative of Q2, Q2 is equal to negative MA B squared all over 2K big Q sine of theta. And that would be our answer. If you wanted to go a step further, you can define what theta is. So if you go back here and look at this picture that we drew, we can define theta. We can define sine of theta from this picture. We can say, okay, the opposite side of theta is r over 2, and the hypotenuse is b. So the sine of theta is r over 2 b. And we can add that back into our equation. So we can say that q1 is equal to mab squared over 2k q over r over 2b. And similarly, q2 is equal to negative mab squared over 2kq over r over 2b. And that is how you solve a Coulomb's law problem. Um, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or anyone else on the support team, and we can totally explain any other of these steps to you. So I hope that was helpful and have a great rest of your day.